It was a beautiful dream. New frontier in broadcasting had opened up. The final frontier. Signals beamed from space, bypassing the limits of earthbound transmission. And a chunk of this new frontier was carved out and planted with a Union Jack. A five channel network. An ITV in space. With a public broadcasting remit and strong British values. It was a beautiful dream. And it died. Almost immediately. Slain by its own incompetence its own rotten luck, and by a rival born of the unrestrained winner-takes-all 80s, with fewer ideals, but a lot more ruthlessness. But it could all have been so different. This is the dream of British satellite broadcasting. In the 70s that satellite broadcasting really became practical and affordable. Television signals flung into orbit and then bounced back to be decoded by the dish for your viewing edification. The idea was first proposed by Arthur C. Clarke as a global communications network requiring just three satellites placed equidistant around the planet. There wouldn't have been very much money in that though. And besides, the Cold War was still on. So a mini space race ensued, in which the Americans managed to engineer the first transatlantic satellite transmission via the politically neutral Telstar. I understand that part of today's press conference is being relayed by the Telstar communications satellite to viewers across the Atlantic, and uh, this is another indication of the extraordinary world in which we live. Only to be trumped by the Russians sending up the very first national network of television satellites, Orbiter, which is still in use today. Clearly, this new frontier was serious business. In 1977, the International Telecommunications Union got together in Geneva to hold one of their infrequent World Administrative Radio Conferences, in which they would periodically decide who owned which invisible radio waves, including in the 1977 one any potential future radio waves set to be fired into the sky and bounced off a satellite. Apart from irritating literally everyone in Britain by mandating that all the radio channels move to new numbers, as a last reminder, the aforementioned changes in wavelengths and frequencies in some cases and lack of changes in wavelengths and frequencies in others as outlined above will come to pass in 1978 on the 23rd of November. The conference assigned each nation in the telecommunications union five satellite channels each to do whatever they liked with. Two of these channels were immediately given over to the BBC, who then spent several years trying to figure out a cost-effective way of running them. Unfortunately, it was painfully obvious the whole time that they couldn't afford to launch one solitary satellite on the revenue provided by the licence fee. 
Eventually, they turned to their commercial rivals, the IBA. They'd been given the three remaining channels rather belatedly when the corporation started to visibly founder. By late 1983, the BBC were ready to give up and strike a deal with them for all five. The government, the most hostile the BBC had ever faced, readily agreed. The IPA managed to scrape together a consortium consisting of Granada, Anglia for some reason, Thorn EMI, who not incidentally owned Thames Television at the time, Richard Branson, and assorted other independent production companies that ended up being dubbed the Club of 21. The idea was that the BBC would own half of the resulting company, Granada and Anglia 30% between them, and the remaining 20% would be divided among the miscellaneous partners. Oh, but the BBC would have to find the cash all by itself for the construction, launch and maintenance of the necessary satellite. It was this last bit that effectively doomed the Club of 21 altogether. By May 1985, the whole thing had collapsed. So now we had the concept of five satellite channels and nothing more, including a satellite or a means or plan to launch one. While the BBC scratched their heads and pondered their two non-existent channels, the IBA decided to just go with what worked before and franchise the damn things. In bulk, of course, not separately, they were daft. The government, as you might expect, were much happier with the idea of a private sector invitational all-in cage match, and the IBA eventually received five bids from various, sometimes bafflingly random corners of the country and beyond. DBS UK was a consortium consisting of LWT, Dixons, a merchant bank, Saatchi and Saatchi, and some relative unknowns called Carlton Communications. The National Broadcasting Service was an alliance between rich bastards James Lee and Robert Holmes at court, neither of whom had any broadcasting experience whatsoever. Sat UK Broadcasting was an alliance between Muir Sutherland, then Director of Programmes at Thames, Jimmy Hartley of the Jam Making Family, and an extremely wealthy Australian from whom we will hear again. No, not that one. And would have broadcast one channel for free and the other two for a further seven quid a month. The major players in the Direct Broadcasting Limited Consortium were British and Commonwealth Shipping, Sears, and that's the British holding company, not the unrelated American department store chain, and that other Australian. It basically would have been Sky Movies, Sky One, and Sky Kids. Finally, there was a consortium formed from the ashes of the Club of 21, including Granada, Anglia and Virgin, plus Pearson, ITN, and in the hardware corner, Alan M. Sugar Training. And this consortium was called British Satellite Broadcasting. Their closest rivals was DBS UK, headed up by power-hungry Michael Green of Carlton. An abortive attempt was made by BSB's bid coordinator Robert Devereux, a Virgin executive and entirely by coincidence Richard Branson's brother-in-law, to tempt Green over to their side. But that fell through when Green insisted he be appointed the consortium's God Emperor and also that the movie channel be scrapped as it was a terrible idea that could never work. So much for Carlton being a part of BSB. Not of course that they needed them. It all came down to a job interview style presentation in front of a row of stone-faced IBA executives and this was Robert Devereux's specialty. One group has emerged which we believe contains the reality of the present with the vision of the future. The IBA has accordingly, this afternoon, offered the contract to British Satellite Broadcasting, BSB. BSB includes the television companies Granada and Anglia, 
the electronics group Amstrad, the entertainment's chain Virgin, and the publisher's Pearson Longman. Four services, financed by both advertising and subscriptions, are planned. A 24-hour news service called Now will involve ITN. Screen will show feature films. Zigzag will show cartoons and wildlife films on the Screen channel during the daytime. And there'll be an entertainment channel called Galaxy with game shows and soup operas. On December 11th, 1986, the IBA announced that BSB had been awarded a 15-year contract to operate three channels on the DBS system. And this will be closer to the final dimensions required for DBS viewing. DBS works like this. A high-powered satellite will be launched in a geostationary orbit, keeping pace with the Earth's revolution, so staying over the same point. In fact, at a height of over 20,000 miles above Brazil. The signal from the DBS station in Britain will be sent to the satellite and then beamed direct back to the viewers. The signal, the footprint, will cover both Britain and some of the rest of Northern Europe. Individual satellite dishes mounted on roofs or in gardens will receive the signals from space and the price for those dishes is expected to come down to around a couple of hundred pounds. Almost instantaneously the phone started ringing off the hook with investment proposals from interested rich people, many of whom had been affiliated with rival bids. By 1987, the BSB consortium had been plumped up with the likes of Alan Bond, who was the Australian behind the SAC UK bid, data crunching firm Reed International, High Street Outfitters Next, for some reason, French boat experts Chargeurs, and many, many more. However, amidst the rush to invest, one of their original partners quietly withdrew. And rather an important one, in Amstrad who was supposed to be handling the technological aspect. Alan Sugar's feet had been cooled by largely practical considerations. BSB's winning bid had included a promise that the receiver kit, dish and all, would cost the average member of the public no more than 250 quid. Now it was all real and not just theory, Sugar was starting to doubt that this was possible. Part of the problem was the transmission standard that they were required to use by the IBA. For years, Europe had either used the PAL system, made in Germany, favoured in Britain, or the highly similar French CCAM. Meanwhile, America used bleary old NTSC, but that's neither here nor there. But the IBA commanded that BSB, or whoever had won the franchise for that matter, use none of these. Instead, they insisted on the use of a system that they considered far superior and to which they held many of the patents, known as DMAC. It was futuristic and flashy and even came in high definition, but it was effectively still in beta, if that. More pressingly, it was, of course, entirely incompatible with any extant television set. Under the terms of the franchise award, this was now BSB's problem, as were the costs. But they weren't over-worried about this right now. With the phone exploding with potential investors, the main concern for the chiefs of the nascent BSB was the colour of their boardroom curtains and the modernist design of their office suites, which also served to alienate the practically-minded Alan Sugar. You get a feeling for people, he said shortly afterwards, and where their priorities lie. When we started listening to them, it seemed their priorities lay in the size of the office suites they had to have, and all that kind of stuff. Their own little luxuries came first. I was being asked to entrust my money to a group of people who were going to run this show, and there was no way I felt comfortable in putting my money in the hands of those people. I looked at the extravagance of what they were going to do there, and you know, when it was time to part with the old Dosharuni, I said, no, thank you very much. The plan at this point was for four stations on three channels. These four stations were to be Screen, the contentious film channel, for which the viewer was to be charged an extra £2.50 subscription. Zigzag for kids, which was to broadcast on the same channel as screen in the mornings and afternoons. 
Galaxy, which was to be BSB's answer to BBC One and broadcast from 6pm, and a channel called Now, for which the vague plan at this point was for it to be the country's first 24-hour rolling news station, with content provided by ITN. Once the feng shui of the office suites had been finalised, it was time for stuff to become real, and BSB transitioned to full corporate status by hiring its executive team. The chairman of the board was to be Sir Trevor Holdsworth, a professional suited man of formidable experience. He'd been chair of the engineering conglomerate GKN since the mid-70s, and was just about to complete his term at the head of the Confederation of British Industry. Below him, BSB's first actual employee was to be Graham Grist. He was the money man, being a former IBM salesman of the year and a name that recurs in the financial history of several major construction projects, including the Channel Tunnel. His title was to be Managing Director of Operations and Finance. Finally, they needed to pick a chief executive. While Grist handled the purse strings and Holdsworth acted as figurehead, the chief executive would be the man, and they didn't for a second consider that it wouldn't be a man, in charge of actually running the company. And for this, they turned to the world of advertising, and the world's biggest and most influential advertising company, Saatchi and Saatchi. Their chief executive had risen without trace at Whitbread Brewers after proving himself a veritable marketing magician. And that's what BSB were after. Someone who could sell the damn service to the public. Apart from a few contrary voices in the consortium who were more worried about the actual programming. The man's name was Anthony Simmons Gooding. But he was and remains universally known as ASG. He was energetic, charismatic and proved almost impossible to dislike. Even the programming-obsessed contrarians in the consortium, the ones who were holding out for a Bill Cotton type, warmed to him almost immediately. If they made a movie out of BSB's story, ASG would be the one played by Michael Sheen. <laughs> British Satellite Broadcasting officially became a company on the 1st of July 1987. Plans were drawn up to launch a pair of satellites with the help of Hughes Aircraft. ASG joined officially on the 19th of October. It was a Monday. Good evening everyone. Well, the law of gravity hit Wall Street today, and financial markets around the world for that matter, as stock prices plunged even more than they did on Black Tuesday of 1929. When the dust settled, the Dow Jones Industrial Average had lost more than 508 points on volume of 604 million shares. That's nearly double the previous record. Suddenly it was a free fall, a better than 22% tumult in the Dow, and nervous traders were looking over their shoulders. The birth of British satellite broadcasting was heralded by the detonation of the worldwide stock market. Like Halley's Comet foretelling doom for King Harold. A warning from space. <laughs> 